Welcome to the Parish Art Museum podcast, where we aspire to provide opportunities for learning, sharing, and celebrating the many innovative and pioneering artists who call the East End home. Come back each week to find new and impactful experiences in the arts. I'm Terry Sultan. I'm the director here at the Parish Art Museum. Tonight is a very special night because it is uh, part of our great and now long-standing collaboration with the Doc Fest. And this is also the launch of something that you might not know about, which is the Hamptons Arts Network Thaw Fest, which is every weekend now for the month of March. We have a website. If you type, type in hamptonsartsnetwork.com or org, you will find us and you will see the schedule. Uh, there are 19 member organizations of the Hamptons Arts Network, believe it or not, in this relatively geographically small community, but big in creativity. And we're all doing special programs each weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, uh, from now till the end of the month as a way to kind of wake us out of our winter doldrums, which haven't been so wintry or doldrumy, but the whole point is, you know, in case it snows, at least there'll be something to do. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Jackie LaFaro, and then we'll, we'll, we'll have the film, and then uh, Audrey and I will have a little bit of a chat, and then we'll let you all run into the museum so you can see her fabulous painting that's on view. Jackie. Thank you. Thank you, Terry, and thanks for this wonderful collaboration with the Parish Art Museum. This is the first uh, event of Thawfest, Terry told you what uh, the Hamptons Arts Network is, that we really try very hard to bring people here for some culture, music, dance, film, and not necessarily for a fundraiser or the beach. And that's a battle. So uh, here we are. You are in for a treat tonight. Queen of Hearts, Audrey Flack, was at our festival. It won the Art and Inspiration Award. And on top of that, it won the Audience Award. So it's a wonderful film, and you see Audrey and all of her bold, sort of from-the-heart personality that she is from when she was at Yale all the way through now. And you're lucky, lucky we're going to have a... Audrey's here, and we're going to have a wonderful... Terry will have a great conversation with her. So that's enough of us, and now it's all for Audrey. Enjoy the movie. So many questions. Where did the impetus to want to make representational images come from? I mean, you started out as an abstract expressionist in your, you know, in your student years and you know the beginning of your professional life. That's all about, you know, the emotion, the elimination of reason from your hand to your mind. So, where do you think that came from? I think it came from basic human instinct that everybody in this room has, that every human being has, that I had. And when you're a child and you draw, you draw stick figures of your mother and your father and your friends, and you draw a moon and a sun and a flower, because as, as human beings, we want to see ourselves, you know? We, I think it's just so gut, so basic. That's why Abex was so revolutionary mm -hmm. in a way. I have so much to say on that subject, but I'm you know, reevaluating it now. But it's not to go into now. It could be an interesting panel discussion. But I, I think there's nobody in this room that hasn't, as a child, or seen your grandchildren and your children draw and they don't draw abstract. They start out drawing that way. So I think that's where it started. And then I saw the old masters. Well, you know, I thought that that section in the movie where they actually talk about the compositional structure of the Jackson Pollock and then overlay it with your picture. And I think that the way that we understand the kind of images that, you know, in photorealism and in, in almost any kind of representational painting, you get caught up in a way in what the actual narrative is saying to you. And sometimes you forget to focus on or look at the formal structures of what goes behind mm -hmm. these paintings is what you know, gives them the power of it. It's like two sides of the same coin. You have the, the actual pictures, 
I mean, and let's face it, that Vanitas picture, which everybody will get a chance to see in a few minutes, that it is so packed with images that have meaning, you know, various meanings to various people who look at it. And then you forget to look at the very complex compositional structure of that picture. Yeah, yeah. You get, by the way, the poem. Do you know who used that poem? Hmm. His whole life. Hmm. Mandela, when he was in prison, oh, really? recited. There's a poem that belongs at the bottom of the frame. And I recited that poem to myself. It sort of kept me going. And I just found out that Nelson, Nelson Mandela, mm. in prison, recited that poem to himself. At, at the time, it was considered a great poem. Then it went out of favor, and it was considered the way my work was considered kitschy and you know lesser. But it's a great poem. So yes, um, my work, I don't know if you remember Spaced Out Apple, the one where the apple is there, or any of them. They're very abstract also. The apple is a circle. A, a slice of orange could be a triangle. And the placement in space, you know, when the picture plane tilts up, I start in most paintings before that, in the history of painting, you walk into a painting, like you walk into a room. There's a floor or walls, there's a ceiling. If it's a car painting, there's a car on the street, on the ground. My work was different because it, it came out of Abex. And when the picture plane is tilted up, Pollock shoots holes in between the ribbons of paint that he's strewn across the canvas. So he's in outer space. That was my thesis at Yale, by the way, in 1950. Was Pollock in outer space? It was called, no, it was <laughs> called the change from space to depth, hmm. from Giotto to Pollock. It was pretty early to write that. So he's going into outer space. Unfortunately, he gets caught out there and he doesn't come back. You know, I think. And the same with de Kooning, because I have a de Kooning story. Had he been able to go back to representational art, it would have grounded him, because mm. it's grounding. What, back to the space. My work, instead of going back, goes out. So the apple is coming out, mm -hmm. or something else is coming in front of me. It's almost like a Fibonacci series of objects, sizes, proportions. And it is really complex, really complex, really thought out. It's not just, you know, an apple laying there and a, a ring or a, you know, a vase. It's besides the complexity of the abstraction and the spatial concepts. Never before have things popped out that way. There's a theory of light, of color, of spraying. If if Roy Lichtenstein uses dots on his lithographs on his paintings, you can see the dots, right? When I spray, when I used to spray, you're, you're spraying dots. Depending on how thick it goes on and how far away, because there are complexities to that too, how diluted the paint is, you get different colors. Cadmium red deep, cadmium red deep, put on with a brush, looks one way. Mm -hmm. Cadmium red deep sprayed on with an airbrush, same color, different color. It's light. So you're right, Terry, it's so complex. And you know we were called dumb, and I defy good taste. <laughs> I love that. You know, I walk by now Madison Avenue, some of these shops. They look just like your paintings. They look like my paintings. They're glitzy. They've got spangles. They've got beads. I guess I'm in good taste now. You know? Well, you know, everything has a cycle of life, right? And you just wait long enough, and it will all come back. Hey, I'm going to be 89 in May. That's I amazing. Better, I better. I got to I got to wait. I've got to wait a little longer. Can't believe it. You know, seeing myself young on there. Ooh. What you look happened? better now than you did then. Oh, thank you. I don't know about the chin. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with your chin. You know, the other thing that I find uh, so compelling about, uh, about the compositions in your paintings is the way that you constructed them. And I think people you know, might forget about this, too. 
because it's, you say that it's photo based and you, you know, you took a slide of it and then you projected it. But before you took a slide of it, you had to build it. Oh. And so remember when you're looking at, at these paintings that there was a still life that, uh, that Audrey constructed very carefully. Oh my goodness. That's and how you propped things up and got things to shoot out. Talk a little bit about, I mean, that's like a whole skill in and of itself. It's almost like oh, building a tank. complex, tie. you know, a lipstick or an object that had to be tilted. How do you get it? You know, the chewing gum, it's tape, <laughs> there's all kinds of things. And then I had boom lights. I was a photographer. Photorealism brings on photography. Photography was not considered. Photorealism is such an important. Where's Lewis? Lewis is a hero. Well, he also, when Ivan Karp said to me, Ivan Karp had a big gallery called the O.K. Harris Gallery, and he was showing photorealism, mm -hmm. and he said, and he had my slides in his pocket. He was, he was giving a lecture, and he was showing all the photorealists, and my slides never came out of his pocket because I was the only female. And I didn't think of it then, you know? And I went to the gallery and I said, I'd like my slides back. And I kind of was upset with him and I gave him a kind of dirty look. And he said, don't be a fool. Do you remember Ivan? Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of raspy voice. He had a cigar. Big giant cigar. Yeah. Big giant cigar and love beads. Mm -hmm. And a ponytail. Yep. And he said, don't be a fool. Paint what I tell you to paint. Paint cars, paint motorcycles, and I'll make you rich and famous. <laughs> As a result, he curated a lot of shows in Europe, of which I was left out of every single one. And I, I was so mad at him. He did, you know, he did suggest French and Company as mm -hmm. a gallery. He wouldn't deal with me. But Lewis, with all his macho ways, did not have that prejudice. No. He didn't. He, he, was great. he showed then and he shows now a lot of women artists. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't make that differentiation. Except to, except to be, you know, kind of proud of the fact that he doesn't do that. So and he you know and, and it was a good relationship with you. Yeah. Many, many years. So these paintings from that period are all about light. They're about a certain kind of space because they started out as uh, still lifes that were photographed and then flattened out because they were projected. But yet, when you're using the uh, the spray gun and you're creating these three dimensionally looking objects because of the way you're able to handle the light, and then these new paintings, after all those years of not starting, are completely, utterly flat. That sort of reminds me of going back to looking down the hole of, in the floor of your of your place. And looking at the, um, the, at, the, the at the inker who was doing the, the comics. And by the way, it was Spider Man, not Batman. <laughs> and that blank canvas is now a completed canvas, the blank canvas, which actually I worked on this morning again, three years <laughs> I'm going. It's pretty well finished. But. So, why does it take you so long to make a painting? Oh, <laughs> actually, that painting should have been finished sooner, but my husband got sick and oh, things God. happened in the family. And it is interesting, too, because the speed with which we live now, with which we, you know, artists just paint. Artists took years to make work. Interesting thing about this painting is um, as much as it frustrated me, I would come out ready to paint and some other thing would happen. And I got sick, and then, you know, life interfered. Vanitas. But the beauty of it is that I would come back after <coughs> six months, as I came back yesterday and started painting the minute I came, and saw something else, and saw something else. And it's richer, and mm. it's better. Um, you have to know when to stop, because it can turn to mud. But there's cooking time. Mm -hmm and development time in life. And it's so important right now in this hysteria that we live in to give yourself that. When did you start playing the banjo? When I was at Yale, there was a math 
genius, and he was very cute, and he was handsome, and we had what they call hoot nannies. They were jam sessions, and he was a banjo player, and he was very sexy, <laughs> and he would sort of play "Keep on Truckin', Mama." A big crush on him, and uh, he didn't know who I was, but I loved that kind of music. Well, I'm from I'm from North Carolina, so you know when I heard you played and and you know just hearing you play on the film, it just you know takes me back so far. The other thing that was nice for me, you know, every time you see something like this, you always have to try to find the way that it it has you know an association with your own life. I worked for Marsha Tucker. I worked for Jan Schneider. My you first worked. job in New York Come City on. was at the Queens Museum. Yeah. So wow. I'm watching this movie. It's like all these people that, that were part of my career, you know, wow. coming up also. Marsha Tucker was amazing. I was looking at that picture of her with the women in the in the um, living room to see if there was anybody there that I, I recognized. But your story about who most of those women were that must have driven her batty. She I'm bringing was the not, men's food and putting no, it. What she did is she put groups together. Uh -huh. She wasn't in. She maybe had her own group but she was not in my group. Mm. I, I mean, I could tell you stories. There's one very famous artist whose wife was a really terrific artist. Who you would know both of them, but I won't mention their names. He beat her. She came in with a black eye, and she would not tell anyone because it would upset his career. Mm -hmm. No, but that's the way things were in those days. Yeah, and you know, at Cooper Union, teachers all hit on you, but they were, uh, they were, Drunk, Abex, <laughs> Albers, and who told me? A curator came to my studio, what three days ago, Sevi, and she said Ray Johnson. She had done work on this artist, Ray Johnson. He was at Black Mountain with Albers. Mm. He had been a convert to square painting, and when he left, he got so upset that he burnt all his paintings. Mm. He burnt Albert's notes. <clears throat> Albert, he said, if you don't do it my way, you might as well commit suicide. Now, you teach. Uh, you obviously don't teach the same way that Joseph Albers taught. No. no. What, uh, what kind of advice do you give your, uh, your students on what they should do and how, sh how they should think and how they should go about being creative and finding their own voice? I'm teaching grad graduate painters now. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the beautiful things about being an artist is that you can deal with the journey of your life. You know, and we all have to grow. Otherwise, you keep making the same mistakes over and over again. You know, besides teaching the technical things. Oh, I have one art. I have an Argentinian, a German, a Croatian. I'm, you know, different students. A girl from Smith. Oh, wait a minute. So you have an Argentinian, a Croatian, <laughs> and a girl from Smith. No, I've got a lot. But, so now, interestingly enough, the German kid, he's very good. Tight. He, he paints with a little brush, and he does little things, and they're wonderful. Mm -hmm. Little Vermeers, little objects. And what do I do with him? You know, he has to balance himself. We all have to balance ourselves. You know, I'm very hyper. I had a temper like my father. I had to, I have to encourage the other side of myself. And you do this within the work. You can do it. So I, one of their thesis things is to make a large painting. Mm -hmm. Well, I said, Michael, can he, like, panicked. He can't make, how can he make a large, it'll take him a lifetime with his little, <laughs> So I, I got him, he, I said, can you do one this size? I'm also trying to get him to blur the edges and focus on mm -hmm. one. So that's how I teach. The Argentinian is a romantic, big, spiritual, you know, he's got to tighten up. <laughs> so one's uh, got to loosen up, one's got to tighten up. One's got to tighten up. The Smith girl, who is really quite intellectual, really bright, paints still lives. Her still lives, a still life, you know, it, a bowl of fruit, objects, her still lives. She paints shelves, 
and there's one object here, mm -hmm. one object here, one object, and her center is not together. So I'm trying to center her. She came in this past Wednesday. I teach Wednesdays. What does she have? Because underneath, you know, when you don't have a center, there's a lot cooking. She came in with about five paintings of a hand picking up a glass which is cracked and broken. Hmm. And that hand is about to get cut. Hmm. But it is a central object. Hmm. So we're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere. <laughs> and I think a good teacher, I'm, I'm pretty strict about them coming on time, about my teaching anatomy and drawing. But you have to be gentle and kind. Yes. There were suicides at Yale yeah. from some really yeah. nasty guy teachers. You don't want to do that. You know, the one passage about with you teaching in the movie that I found so touching was the segment when you were working with the models and, and you told them, don't draw, just mm -hmm. go and look around, walk around. Them and walk around and, and then talked about the humanity of the people that they're looking at and how when they start to draw, they need to be reminded of that. So I think that certainly in this, uh, in this time period, the, the thing that might be the biggest takeaway from all this is that we just have to remember that there is humanity in what we're looking at, and that's what we need to, that's what we need to know when we're experiencing art. Yeah, and you know, right after that, when I say let's work, I'm really tough. No, I mean, they <laughs> well, get a one minute pose, I time them, their <laughs> pencils have to go down after a minute, I can bring them down to 30 seconds, yeah. sometimes 15 seconds, and then they go up. But you know, one thing I did want to say in terms of photorealism, mm -hmm. the modern rehung their collection. Not, Not one, one work photorealist of painting. Very little realism. Well, maybe the next time. I don't know. You know, art world is, uh, art is so fickle yeah. and so temporal. I did go down to the Lehman collection at the Met, and there are, oh, about four or five Rembrandts that are so so fabulous. And Rembrandt dies in poverty. Mm -hmm. He has to sell his house. He has to sell his collection. His wife dies. His son dies. And right next to it, uh, at the end of the uh, wall, there's a big painting of, of a mythological scene. It's flat. Not very good. Those artists, those <laughs> mythological artists knock out Rembrandt because his paint was too thick <laughs> and he painted people and they were real people. They weren't idealistic figures of mythology. And I thought, and now you never heard of that artist. It happens. It happens. So I think that we'll stop because I do want everybody to have a chance to go inside the galleries before we have to close up and have a look at, at this gorgeous painting that you've been looking at. Uh, on the screen, you have to see it in real life. It just doesn't, as good as that film was, it just doesn't tell you what you need to see. Audrey, thank you so much. <laughs>